Mr. Babin. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank the witnesses for being here as well. Um, fascinating uh, stuff. And uh, it looks to me like from what I hear, and I've read a lot of your stuff here, uh, Mr. Schellenberger, and, um, that nuclear may be the, the only way uh, that we can uh, get off of uh, the dependence on uh, fossil fuels or, or uh, because obviously we, uh, the renewables don't seem to cut the mustard. Uh, but the U.S. has always been the leader in nuclear power construction in the past uh, for safe and reliable nuclear plants. Uh, but uh, I noticed that China and Russia are leading in the number of plant construction uh, around the world. Many, uh, many other nations are uh, kind of uh, saddling up to them in dependence uh, on, on these, these two nations when we build a better plant. So uh, if that's the... If that's one of the problems, uh, what uh, the price tag of, of clean energy is so high right now, uh, at what point do you see clean energy becoming cheaper and more viable? And is it going to be uh, a reversal of the, the trend that we're seeing on nuclear here in the, in the United States? And when you say clean energy, are you referring, sir, to nuclear in specific, or are you saying um, all low-carbon energies, including renewables. I, I would say, well, I was talking specifically about the nuclear uh, end of it, because you had had so much uh, in your uh, documentation here that I was reading about, so I would say that. Yeah, I mean, You can throw key, in the other ones, too. I'd like to, I'd like to hear what you have. To sure. Say. I'll give you one uh, study we did where we calculated that had Germany spent the $580 billion it's estimated to spend on renewables by 2025, had it spent it on nuclear, it would already be at 100% yeah. zero emissions right electricity, and it would have completely decarbonized its transportation supply. A uh, similar case in California. So it's very easy to do those calculations. The, the, the challenge for nuclear is that it requires national level commitment from the top. It really requires the president to be a leader on it. It requires significant congressional leadership. I would note that, for example, Russia is also has abundant natural gas supplies, and what it's choosing to do is replace its use of natural gas domestically with nuclear power plants and export its natural gas abroad. That seems like a great recipe for energy dominance. It seems like that would be the heart of an energy dominance strategy internationally and one that the United States would do well to follow. But again, it really requires this kind of long-term national commitment. Absolutely. Uh, we, we hear a lot of extreme rhetoric uh, in fact, uh, some of us Republicans are, are uh, you know, the, the claim is that we're climate change deniers and nothing can be further from the truth. I've got a science background myself. I'm a, I'm, I'm a dentist uh, a, uh, with a biology degree and, and, and studies in, in, in science. But we're, we're told, and I, I, I can tell you that we know that the, that the climate is changing. There's no question about it. No, no district has been hit any harder than mine down in southeast Texas by hurricanes and floods. Uh, so we know things are happening. Uh, but we also uh, hear some of this extreme rhetoric. Uh, civilization will end without radical action. Children are suffering from eco-anxiety and depression. And uh, no credible sign, I noticed, or, or I read where no credible scientific body has ever claimed that climate change threatens the collapse of our civilization are the extinction of homo sapiens. And uh, yet we hear politicians and the media are making these claims. I'd like to hear your opinion and uh, tell me what you're thinking about that. Thank you for asking that question. It's very troubling, the rise of this rhetoric. It's obviously been around for several decades, but it's become much more acute in recent years. What we've done is we've went and interviewed the scientists who activists told us they were relying on for those catastrophous claims. Four of the scientists we interviewed all claimed that they were misquoted. One of them told us that it was based on his best estimation that the world could not sustain half of its human population at four degree temperature rise. We asked him what that was based on. He said it was just him speculating. In fact, there are studies by the Food and Agriculture Organization and the major factors that determine how much food we will grow, because the only way you can really come up with collapse of civilization scenarios is with a collapse of food supply that the major studies show that, the, that the, what determines food output in the future is the same thing that's determined in the past, which is whether poor countries have access to fertilizer, irrigation, and tractors. 
And so if we're really concerned about um, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, or South Asia, where people are much more vulnerable and dependent on, on nature, on uh, less resilient, then we should be helping them to, to industrialize agriculture, to, in, you know, to, to urbanize, to gain access to factories. That's already starting to happen in Ethiopia. It should happen in the rest of the continent. So what bothers me is the way that this apocalyptic discourse is used to justify denying poor countries cheap baseload electricity, not just from fossil fuels, but we've also seen this effort to stop poor countries from getting large hydroelectric dams and large nuclear power plants. So what I always say to my colleagues is if you're so worried about denial, then I think you should stop trying to deny poor countries the cheap, reliable sources of electricity and energy that they need in order to survive a hotter world. Absolutely, and I, my time has expired, and uh, I, for one, am very happy that uh, we had the uh, availability of fracking uh, and the uh, uh, increased production in natural gas in my home state, which has led to energy independence for the United States and a lowering of emissions uh, that have been very, very significant. So thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and 